Um, thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity um, to speak today. So, um, as we said, I'll be speaking on behalf of the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre and also um, my fellow co-director and founding director, Professor Andrew Wilson, and also the leadership exec of the centre and um, some of the members of the coordinating centre too. Um, it's based on uh, many discussions that we had about what we've learned over the last 10 years um, and hopefully you'll find some of these, uh, the insights um, useful. Um, but I'd like to also begin by acknowledging the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And also I'd like to thank Thomas and Odette and Kirsty for a fantastic session about the importance of the voice. And I thought it was so inspiring and it certainly inspired us to think about how we can support that um, better. Got to remember to uh, move forward the slides. So the lessons that um, we've be, I'd like to talk to, uh, we've grouped into these um, six categories, um, six themes. Um, and I'll um, talk about each one in turn. Um, but as I said, it's really, it's not just my lessons, but it's based on the discussions that have been happening across the network and across the prevention center. And I'd like to begin by talking a bit about equity because this is a session about prevention and equity. Um, so, a quote to start with from Sir Michael Marmot. Um, as we know, he's the um, godfather of uh, inequities, addressing and measuring the inequities in health. And we were really fortunate recently to record um, a podcast with Sir Michael Marmot when he was visiting um, Australia. Um, and he, um, I've taken this from the transcript of that podcast because he put forward um, a really interesting proposition, which is let's make the assumption that everybody could potentially have the same good health as the people at the top. And I think that's one of the first lessons, is that in order for us to address equity, we really do need to focus on preventing the avoidable health inequalities or the disparities between groups. So obviously individuals are going to have varying levels of health, but we're talking here about social groups and the importance of ensuring that social groups have the same opportunity to have the same levels of health. We know that um, a very large proportion of chronic disease is preventable. So for example, up to 40% if we address some of those key risk factors, behavioral risk factors. But um, the question is, to what degree are the disparities between groups preventable? Um, and the fact that they are preventable, he's proposing here that they could potentially all be preventable and we're not doing enough about it, is inherently unfair. So I think the first lesson is that um, we should always consider equity as a measure of success for prevention and putting it front and foremost is the most important way of making sure that we do that. So if you would like to um, listen to that podcast, I don't know if people are familiar with our podcast Prevention Works, but they're all available on our website or any other podcast um, app um, and you can listen to that one with um, Michael Marmot. So, um, prevention, and there's a few themes that I'd like to touch on that have been touched on by a number of people already this morning um, at the workshop this morning about advocating for prevention research, but also in the session before. What we're talking about here is empowering the prevention system, because we all know that um, prevention is really about creating change through the organized actions of society. And in order for us to have an effective and equitable prevention system, and that relies on us being all connected and better informed, um, being aligned and empowered in the things that we're asking for and working together as a whole. We're not always going to have consensus on everything, but if we can align our messaging and align our work, then we're going to be much more effective. So I think um, it's about, I think what we'd like to emphasize here is that it is all about co collective action. And in order for us to be able to do that, I think the important thing is that we need to be able to invest in the right mechanisms to support that kind of collective action. So this is an image, um, I was trying to look for an image that would represent what it can sometimes feel like when you're making the case for prevention. Um, and that's what it can feel like when you're competing for research funding against the basic sciences or the clinical sciences, or if you're trying to defend a preventive health budget against the ever-growing demands of acute health services, or like the PHAA advocating for um, an increase from, say, 2% to just 5% of the health budget. Um, but what would it take for the prevention system to become more powerful and to become a bit more um, lion-esque, I suppose you could say? So what we're talking about here is 
how do we empower ourselves so that we are more effective and more collective, so that we're more um, connected and anti-siloist, as one member of our leadership exec put it, so that we can be more strategic and more influential as a prevention system. And I think the key thing there is for us to really think of ourselves as a system. So whether we're working in research or in practice or in policy, um, whether we're an NGO or our role is in advocacy, how can we actually think more of ourselves as a prevention system that works as a whole and aligns and collaborates and reinforces each other? So the next um, topic that I'd like to touch on is the idea of shared value and how we build shared value. Because I think the idea that for us to work as a prevention system, we really need to have a sense of what that shared value might be, whether it's to increase funding for prevention research or grow investment in prevention with either in health sector or outside of the health sector, or creating dedicated funding streams for prevention research. And this is taken, this image is taken from um, the Grattan Institute's recent report about the Center for Disease Control, um, the Highway to Health report. And the thing that they was try, they, it's trying to communicate here is that we've had many um, connect prevention efforts, but they've been inconsistent at a national um, level, and they've often been short term. So they in, get introduced, and then the next government comes in, and they get cancelled, and they get changed. Or importantly, even where we do have some really exciting um, policies or strategies, there's never enough funding or enough focus for their implementation. So I think, again, there's something about being able to work more coherently as a prevention system. And the Grattan Institute and also the Partnership Centre have put forward the case that maybe that's something that the Centre for Disease Control could um, enhance and add to as long as there's a strong enough focus on prevention and that's not all going to be focusing on communicable disease. So the next um, lesson is really about learning from the history um, of what we already know. And um, as you know, we've had many decades um, focused on evidence, getting evidence into practice. Um, Jonathan Lomas from um, Canada in 1997 wrote a report, Beyond the Sound of One Hand Clapping, that was focusing on disseminating and improving the uptake in the health sector um, of evidence. Um, and um, he also did a report for the National Health and Medical Research Council that actually led to the establishment of the Partnership Centre scheme in 2013 that um, funded um, the Prevention Centre one, as one of three partnership centres. Um, but systems thinking has also introduced this um, idea that we really, how important it is for us to close the loop. So it's not just about getting evidence into policy and practice, but it's also about ensuring that the real world questions that policy and practice are grappling with actually inform the type of research that we do and that there's a, there is a closing of the loop and that there's a lesson that's being drawn from policy and practice that's informing um, research going forward. Um, as I mentioned, the um, NHMRC Partnership Centre for Better Health was established in 2013, and it was actually a really inspired approach because NHMRC put up a special initiative where they matched the funding of governments, so Commonwealth, state and territory governments, NGOs, that were put together money into a pooled fund to support um, p groups like the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre. And, and we're focusing specifically on chronic disease prevention, but also applying systems thinking and systems approaches um, to, the, to addressing chronic disease, so to um, chronic disease prevention research. And I think the important um, lesson from the, really that we've learned over the last 10 years is that if we're wanting to create these outcomes, so growing systems capacity, growing the capacity of the prevention system, for example, to apply systems thinking, um, growing its capacity to be influential and to have relevant policy relevant research, have stronger connections, have stronger exchange, have more impact and supporting our emerging leaders, then it's important to consider what exactly it is that we're funding and how we're funding it. And um, some of the key elements of this partnership centre scheme was that to ensure that the research was always applied. So it was always co-designed. Um, it always, its real focus was to answer applied policy relevant questions. The funds was a pooled fund that was contributed to both by NHMRC, but also by the national state territory governments and NGOs, so that they had to identify priorities of shared value across jurisdictions. Um, that there were always policy and practice partners on research projects, and that science communication was embedded in everything um, that we do. And importantly, I think, that there is a coordinating centre which was well funded by the partner funds 
to ensure that there was these strong connections that were happening across the prevention system so that jurisdictions and universities could collaborate and work together. So the growing networks of the Partnership Centre. Um, I'm not expecting that people would be able to see um, all of the names, but the idea really is to communicate that from the funding partners, a number of organisations have joined and collaborated over the last decade. And you can't do that without funding some of that core relational infrastructure um, of the coordinating centre. We can't expect these long-term aligned coordinated partnerships just to happen organically. People just don't have the capacity within individual organisations to do that. So I think it's really important so that we're investing in some of those core infrastructure that support partnerships. So support the convening, support communication, support community, communities of practice for being established and supporting things like our emerging leaders network that provide opportunities for practitioners and researchers to meet and collaborate early on in their career. So I think that relates to the um, next topic of nurturing partnerships. And I think the key thing here is that you know, incentivizing partnerships is important, of course, like partnership grants, but for them to succeed and flourish, they really do need to be nurtured and need to be nurtured over time. And I just want to share one example um, of a collaboration that wasn't part of the original grant, but that's emerged because of an opportunity that has come up um, when four CREs and NHMRC Centres of Research Excellence wanted to collaborate together. So as you know, CRE budgets haven't increased over the last 10 years, so they're having to do more with less. Um, and four CREs decided that we, they wanted to collaborate with the support of the Prevention Centre, particularly around the um, science communication, um, but also in terms of supporting their early and mid-career researchers, providing capacity building opportunities. The workshop this morning about research advocacy led by Anna Peters and others was a, a part of the CRE collaboration and its advocacy working group. Um, and what was really exciting was that the policy partners, so you know, CREs are research centres, but it was the policy partners who said that they were very happy for some of the pooled funds, for their pooled funds to go to supporting this collaboration because they were excited by the fact that these centers of research excellence would collaborate on how they would communicate the implications of their research and the fact that they didn't have to go to each into CRE individually, but that they could potentially have a, an aligned message from the, each of the CREs about what the implications were for policy and practice of their programs of research. Um, and so they invested in funding a science communication role to support SERI and also for the coordinating centre of the partnership centre to provide some of those convening and coordinating functions that would enable um, these CREs to collaborate. And it grew from four CREs to now 11 CREs that are working in prevention. And I think there's real scope. You know, there, there are many other CREs that focus on chronic disease prevention and there's a real scope for greater and further collaboration. Um, if you're interested to learn a bit more about SERI, we do have a SERI dedicated page um, also on the website. And there's lots of resources there that have been collaboratively put together by the CREs. Things like how to write a communications plan, um, how to run an online session, so that CREs can learn about those things from each other's experience, so that someone setting up, for example, a new CRE can really draw on the experience both of the prevention centre but also of CREs who are coming to the end of their five years. So I think the, um, the key message really from here is that supporting partnerships really does take time. Um, it requires consistency and continuity of funding and support, and it requires the structures and the commitment and the con continuity of people um, to maintain. And I think what's important here is that early career um, researchers or policy practitioners need an authorising environment to invest that time. So we need their senior people and their organisations to say this is really worthwhile. It's worthwhile you investing the time and the effort to develop these relationships from early in your career, acknowledging how long it takes, and also be, to have the mentoring from more senior um, colleagues so that they're supported to do this effectively. Um, and I think the key message here is never too early to start developing relationships with other centres, with other disciplines, um, with uh, people outside of the health sector, for example. So um, it's just a few words about science communication. We've got a really amazing science communication team with the Prevention Center. We're very lucky to have that, and I've certainly learned a lot about science communication um, over the years since I've been working with the group. 
Um, one of the key lessons, or early lessons for me, was the difference between science communication and more traditional corporate comms. Um, science communication really is about focusing them on the meaning and the practical implications of our research. Whereas corporate communications, which is often what a lot of university comms teams would focus on, is more about managed messaging and PR and promoting the organisation itself, rather than focusing on communicating the findings and what they mean for policy and practice. Um, I think the other key areas there are the fact that there really does need to be time to develop trust between the investigators and the, and the science communications experts, that it really is based on relationships of mutual respect so that science comms is recognised as a real prevention area of expertise that draws on journalism and design, um, data analytics and stakeholder engagement, and that we always use a focus so that we know what our purpose um, is and what the audience is, what's the purpose of the communication and who's the audience, um, and that we invest in it as a core capacity. So I think a key lesson um, for me is that if we could possibly allocate some resources for embedding science communication in everything that we do in prevention, it would have a, um, a huge impact on the fact that um, on its recognition as an as a area of, that's worthy of investment. And again, I just encourage, um, if you want to go and have a look onto our website, we've got a resource hub where you'd see lots of examples of the sort of science communication um, outputs that have come from this team, from the communications team and our investigators. So we've got stories in the, in the newsletter, we've got the podcasts, policy briefs, findings briefs, just to give you a sense and a feel um, for what that um, looks like. So the final two topics, um, that, and they're actually both kind of related. So the, um, the, the next one is systems approaches. So as you know, um, the Prevention Centre was set up, as I said, um, to apply um, systems methods, tools to the d study of chronic disease, um, but also to build a capacity for systems thinking in the prevention system itself more broadly. And I, I, I'm delighted to say, and I certainly I could, from um, judging by the last year's Public Health um, Association Preventive Health Conference, systems approaches really have become very mainstream. Um, and I think that's really wonderful and really exciting. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge people like Penny Hoare and Alan Scheel who set up the initial system science capacity, but also some of the modelers like Joanne Atkinson and Louise Freeburn who were instrumental in translating the sort of modeling that's been used in communicable disease um, or in climate science for a long time, translating that to prevention and public health so that we've actually become much better now at modeling and forecasting the long-term impacts of a policy or an intervention. And to assess that, drawing on all of the different evidence, putting that together into a model, and to judge and compare the impact of potential policies um, before we invest the money, which for something like chronic disease, which has the long-term outcomes, I think has been really important. Again, um, there are many examples on our website um, of uh, systems thinking being applied um, to chronic disease prevention research. Um, I think the other thing that's important is that um, the systems approaches are really valuable for planning intervention, so for planning action. And um, Steve Allen has particularly been great at doing that around his obesity work, where he uses a systems approach with a whole community to discuss and identify all the different factors that contribute to the problem of chronic disease or of obesity within that community, and then allows the community to under, have a shared understanding of what the problems are, and then identify and target the areas for intervention. Um, this poster is um, from a project that is available on the website as well, is um, a f Aboriginal food security project that's led by Simone Sharif and her team where Aboriginal communities identified the issues that were driving food insecurity and what some of the solutions um, might be. I think systems thinking is also useful for us to think about what our role is within the wider prevention system or within the system within which we work. Um, and another tool that um, you might find useful is the prevention systems change framework. And it's also on our website, and it's actually um, adapted for the systems change framework by Penny Foster Fishman, but adapted for the prevention setting. And it helps people to think through about what's the system I'm working in, what's the change I'm trying to create, and what could my role be, and how could I implement that. So I think systems thinking is useful, like we said, for both for research, for planning community interventions, but also for thinking about ourselves and our role within the prevention system and how we are interlinked as a whole system. 
And I think um, one more thing on systems is it's so important for us to remember the importance of boundary spanners. It's a nice term from systems theory, but basically it means the organizations at groups that, and groups that span the boundaries of the prevention system. So here I'm talking about organization, professional organizations like the Public Health Association, such an important boundary spanner, the prevention system, the croaky health media that I'm sure many of you read, um, new initiatives like HEAL, so the Healthy Environment and Lives, a special initiative funded by NHMRC focused on health and climate change, um, the Climate and Health Alliance, all system spanners that help us connect and align and work collaboratively as a system. And potentially, we'll, we'll see, I imagine in the new, um, the forthcoming budget, what the role of the Centre for Disease Control can contribute to creating a system that's more aligned and um, cohesive in Australia. So um, finally, just a few words about co-benefits. Um, this is a topic that's become of um, ever-growing interest um, to both policy practice um, partners and really what it's focusing on here is working outside of the health system um, and identifying win-win solutions because I've been mentioned a few times most of prevention happens outside of the health sector, not in the health sector. So we really need to know how to work well with other sectors outside of health and identify win-win solutions so that we have shared goals, um, multiple policy targets that are aligned both within and outside the health sector, and we're talking about co-benefits. Um, we've got a page that's focused on that. I can see you're standing there, so I must be running short of time. Um, so I just want to emphasize, last couple of slides, um, transformative system change. I think the lesson here is that we really do need transformative systems change to be a healthy and sustainable and an equitable country. And this is an image from the Climate and Health Alliance report from 2021 that compared four potential scenarios looking into the future um, and with the type of systems change that's needed in order to achieve a healthy and sustainable community and what would happen if we don't actually do that kind of transformative change. So that the report. And just the final slide, I think I'll go back to um, Professor Michael Marmot. It's not just about the co-benefits of healthcare, it's the co-benefits of action on the social determinants of health, which will create a better and um, fairer society. So all the talk of, um, again, of systems change and co-benefits, I think we always have to, as I said at the beginning, remember that equity really is and should be always at the heart um, of prevention. And we, it's important for us to be focused on that goal. So um, thanks again um, for the time and the opportunity to talk today. And um, please visit our website if you want any more information. Thank you.